Once again, thank you for joining us. If you're just coming in, feel free to drop your name and where you're coming from in the chat box. We are so glad that you could join us for How to Be a Legislative Advocate, our free webinar with National Farm Worker Ministry. I'm gonna introduce our presenters. In addition to myself, I'm Rose Green Flores. I'm the Director of Communications here at National Farm Worker Ministry. We also have Julie Taylor. So Julie, if you wanna do a little wave, she is the Executive Director at National Farm Worker Ministry. And then also with NFWM, we have Austin Spence. He is an intern from the Masters of Divinity program at Duke Divinity School. And then we are also happy to have a guest speaker with us. We have Giovanna Ohaka. She is the Migration Policy Program Director at Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. <coughs> So once again, thank you for joining us. This is being recorded. So if Julie, if you want to go ahead and start the presentation. <laughs> and if you're just coming on, feel free to put your name and the chat box and where you're coming from. Good evening. Uh, my name is Austin Spence. I'll be kicking us off um, this evening. I, like I said, a Rose said, I'm interning with National Farm Worker Ministry, and it's just a, a, a blast to do something like this with you all. Thank you for coming out during your evening or, or afternoons. Um, so the, the big question that we want to be talking about tonight is why legislative advocacy advocacy in general. Um, there's a big, large need for uh, partnership in this area because legislation advocacy is one of the opportunities that we have to engage and stand in support with farm workers from afar. Um, we get to leverage our situated place for the betterment of our brothers and sisters. And so NFWN represents consumers, advocates, and people of faith and conscience who want to support the farm worker movement. Uh, this is a great tool to support farm workers from afar and near. Um, they are of special concern for the church's ministry and are by the nature of the, their way of life excluded from many of the economic and social benefits enjoyed by other workers. So part of this work means coming alongside in close proximity to the communities who are facing issues revolving around power imbalances. That is a, a good hit word to think about while we're joining in on these advocacy efforts. Um, this allows us to not control the space primarily, but requires something of us that we hand over when we partner. Mainly, we must appear willing to listen and dwell alongside the folks that we would like to advocate alongside first. And so the work of NFWN is standing in solidarity with farm workers and seeking systemic change in policies <laughs> that affect them. And this is important within a democratic society because there's a need to address power and balance in our communities, in our nation. It is not a question of whether or not farm workers face this imbalance. What is needed now is a rediscovery of the need for relationality and common life shared within our politics. And so legislative advocacy allows us to stand in and use our voice in our situated place to sustain a relationship with others that honors farm workers 
in the midst of disagreements that emerge from a life with others. So all in all, we, we cannot have this democracy slash good politics without knowing others or our neighbor. It's indicative to our support of farm workers to know them. And it's the same thing to know the folks that we are trying to get policies moving on. And so Julie, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. So knowing our neighbor and knowing our farm worker friends and brothers and sisters is paramount. We also need to know the specific issues that they are facing. Now, this is just a list of a larger extensive list of the issues that farm workers are facing today. Um, in order to feed a, the country, an estimated 2 million farm workers labor in fields and on ranches across the United States. They handpick the vast majority of fruit and vegetable crops produced here, and they are the backbone of a $200 billion agricultural industry. To turn the system around, farm workers are organizing to demand a seat at the table with the people and institutions that they have the ability to change their inhumane working and living conditions. So to briefly pitch each issue that is included on this page, when it comes to immigration reform, agricultural work in the United States leans heavily on the people immigrating to dune farm work. And so that means that we need to focus on advocating for immigration policy that values workers and rids preventative barriers for them to gain citizenship, receive education, or even to legally operate a vehicle. By reducing the barriers that the immigrants need to jump over for better status, we reveal farm workers' value to them in order to stand up for better treatment in the workplace without the threat of deportation. When it comes to farm workers in the environment, uh, they're some of the people who face the front lines and the initial climate change impact. As climate change forces significant agricultural adaptations and farmers are pressured to making shortcuts concerning labor, farm workers will feel the initial and most severe impacts on their working and living conditions. We'll touch on some US labor laws later, but for most farm workers, they lack basic labor product protections such as workers' compensation, health insurance, and disability insurances. Farm workers remain excluded from federal prote protections of the National Labor Relationship Act from 1935, which forbids employers from firing a worker for joining, organizing, or supporting a labor union. With this, they, they face low wages, which is the great paradox of our food system where the very people who work to feed the U.S. struggle to find their feed their own families. The farm workers are less likely to be securely paid a minimum wage if they cannot meet the hourly picking rate for specific produce, which can tend to push farm workers to their limit and oftentimes cause some injuries moving on to health and safety. It is hard work. Working against the weather elements can be deadly, they run the risk of heat-related injuries and illnesses based on the incentive to work harder and faster without breaks. Farm workers face an insurmountable task of getting health care based on a variety of reasons surrounding documentation status. Along with this, their housing that is offered to farm workers are commonly substandard housing conditions. Many workers pay high prices to live in crowded, unsanitary conditions, which often lack basic utilities. They often live in isolated areas far away from vital services, such as health clinics, grocery stores, and public transportation. Children in the fields, we'll touch on again with the CARE Act later, but children farm workers run rampant in an infrastructure of agriculture in the United States, yet they are some of the least protected and advocated for demographics. While farm work is difficult for anyone who take part, children are especially vulnerable to the working conditions based on their growth and development stage. Also psychologically, 
Children farm workers are tossed into an intense industry that can be extremely taxing on their emotional well being. And finally, for the last of this slide, women in agriculture face a, a large task as well. While they play a vital role in harvesting our food, women are arguably the most exploited workers in this country. Females in the fields are often given least desired, lowest paying jobs and are first to be laid off, receiving fewer opportunities to advance and faced a culture of discrimination and machismo in the workplace, not to mention gender discrimination, sexual harassment, and the extra responsibility of tending to be the primary caregivers of children. Julie, will you move on one more? Now, the last slide is why we focus on this work to be faith-based primarily. Uh, there's something unique about the religious and liberative messages across religions. Uh, most religions are founded upon a seeking of justice, a seeking of love and care for the other, while ultimately serving some greater purpose. And we seek to honor the innate dignity that is part of all of God's people. In the book, The Ministry of the Dispossessed, Chris Hartmeyer speaks about why it's necessary for a faith group to advocate like this. And he says, the Christian separated from people who are struggling for justice develops only a flabby piety. If we remain outside of proximity to the very people we are hoping to serve and show the love of our God or a different God, we lack the skin in the game mentality that means advocating for people. Now, unfortunately, we recognize that this value is not always offered to people, this innate dignity. And so, what the necessary movement is, is coming close and choosing to stand beside and not label them as people to serve or people to help, as if we had the resources to do so. We are not the saviors in this, this advocacy effort. We want to develop a meshwork mentality amongst believers and alongside our brothers and sisters in the field, which allows us to see us in them and them in us, that we may show up to speak to legislators and to affect policy change in order for the bettering and the flourishing of life for all. Julie, will you move on one more? And so tonight we'll be speaking on a few different acts and policies that we have been instructed in persuaded by farm workers and our friends in the fields to, to speak on and to hopefully get more movement on in, in the 2023 year. Um, all the legislation that you will see will need to be reintroduced in this Congress, and it might be slightly changed. It will need of the backing of many co-sponsors. And the largest one that we're facing is the bipartisan support. And so with each of the, the next few acts, you'll see a synopsis, uh, what we are doing to work alongside different partners and what we are doing in-house through educational webinars and other advocacy support. We'll speak very briefly on some allies and partners. And then finally, we'll cast a vision for a strategy for the year. So the very first act that we'll speak on is the Children's Act for Responsible Employment and Farm Safety Act, which you can also see as the CARE Act. The bill is looking at children who are working in agriculture. Right now, there are not enough protections around them. Um, they face different distinctions from other working sectors that calls into question their safety. Um, and so the, the bill is going to revise the current labor provisions to include more protection for child, child workers by prohibiting employment of children under 14. Right now, that number is at 12. It would also raise the minimum age requirements for hazardous working conditions, which agricultural work is at 16, and it would be raised to meet the 18 age for other sectors. Um, a great example of that is 
If you drive a forklift at Walmart, you have to be 18. But if you do so in an agricultural environment, you have you can be 16. This makes no sense other than the environment that they're in. They're both hazardous and they both need some skill. This will also increase the fines for employers violating such protections. Um, within this, there's a certain safety that children will feel knowing that their employers are doing the right thing and they aren't cutting and exploiting them in certain ways. This legislation closes the gap with the fair labor standards. We're just asking for child agricultural workers to be treated properly across the board. We'll also improve legislation protecting children from pesticide exposure and many more. The main thing in the language of this is this bill will not interfere with the way family farms are run. The children of farm owners working on their parents' farm are not within the bounds of this legislation. It is for primarily farm workers, uh, migrant workers, and the like. So there's a large discrepancy that needs to be said within that. Move on, thank you. Our primary uh, partners and allies, uh, Child Labor Coalition with Reed Mackey and Alianza, Alianza Nacional de Capesinas. Uh, within the last year of the congressional cycle, we are close to the goal of co-sponsors numbers. Uh, additionally, to the points listed earlier, influencing the Department of Labor will be necessary in protecting children in the fields against hazardous working conditions. Austin, if you're able to slow down just a little bit so the translator can keep up with you, that would be great. Thank you, sorry about that. Doing a great job, I'm sure. Um, so the, the goal of this is really seeking equal treatment to all children workers in the agricultural sector. Uh, the Congresswoman who, I believe it's the representative Roy Ball Allard, uh, they are no longer in the position, but we're hoping for Representative Grijalva of Arizona to reintroduce it in the months or weeks to come. Uh, the goal of the Child Care Act um, is just to seek protection for children, for the vulnerable um, who are not being recognized as someone who needs protecting in their working environment. Yeah, um, I did wanna mention if you have a question, uh, feel free to go ahead and put that in the chat box. We will have a time for question and answers but I don't want you to forget your question. So go ahead and put it there and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can during the Q&A portion. So the next act that we wanna to talk to you about is banning all neurotoxic organophosphate pesticides from our food act. So obviously that's a mouthful um, and try to say that five times fast, but we just call that the Ban Ops Act, and that's how uh, you'll see it referred to mostly. So it really calls out the fact that organophosphates, which are a group of pesticides, they are inherently neurotoxic, and they have been linked to multiple neurodevelopmental conditions such as ADHD. So people who are exposed at high doses over a brief period can experience, oh, you went too fast on me. So um, you can get exposed either through a high dose or a brief period, or it could be that you're experiencing low doses, but it's frequent. Um, so those that are exposed the most are farm workers and not just those who are handling the pesticides, but as you can see in the picture, those that are picking, those that have the pesticide residue on the, the produce. But also if someone is living near a field where it's being sprayed, then they are exposed to pesticide drift. So that could be farm workers or that could be residential areas near the fields. The bill will prohibit 
any organophosphate pesticides in food. And it also prohibits having any residue from uh, organophosphates as well. Next slide. So our partners on this are Alianza Nacional de Campesinas, Lideres Campesinas, and the Farm Worker Association of Florida. And then our ally is Earth Justice and some others. I really wanna kind of call out uh, the ally Earth Justice because they've done a lot of work creating educational materials just about the impact of organophosphate pesticides. If you see that picture, that is a map of, so it's a kind of a heat map of pesticide volume usage in the US. So you can see it's widespread. Um, it's the organic phosphate, as I said, is a group of pesticides and it's, it's dozens of, of different pesticides. So it's used on a variety of different produce. Once again, um, if you go to or Earth Justice, you can look at the, the produce that is highly contaminated. You can zoom into these areas on the map. So if you want to look more specific at your area, you can use these tools that Earth Justice has created. So that was the big part is, is education. But uh, some of the work that we've also previously done is contacted select representatives from the Energy and Commerce Committee. And we held multiple meetings with those and we had multiple people co-sponsor the bill. For this upcoming Congress, 118th, we hope that it will once again be introduced in the House, but we also want it to be introduced in the Senate. They are hoping to find a Senate champion for this bill. Um, I did see a question about including, and I'm sorry, I can never pronounce this one of uh, this pesticide, chlorofrefos, but yes, I'm pretty sure that one is included on in uh, as an organophosphate, organophosphate pesticide. Um, if you live in California, they're really hoping to get Senator Padilla to be the Senator champion of this bill. So if you're in California, you can certainly help us with that. But across the, the nation, we need to get our senators and representatives to support this bill. And I hope you can tell from the map that yes, it impacts farm workers, but we also all eat this food. So it impacts consumers as well. Next slide. Okay, so another piece of legislation that the National Farm Worker Ministry has worked on is the Fairness for Farm Workers Act. So this goes back to some of those U.S. labor laws that Austin was talking about earlier that excluded farm workers from the same provisions that other um, industries have for their employees, specifically overtime pay. Um, at the time it was enacted, it also excluded farm workers from minimum wage, but since then that particular piece of it has been updated. However, overtime has not. And so this particular bill uh, would extend overtime pay protections to all agricultural workers in every state. Some states have already enacted uh, legislation like this. So on a state by state basis, but it's a much smaller number than certainly for a federal piece of legislation. Um, and so the overtime pay requirements just don't apply under current law to um, farm workers in the same way as it does to other workers. So what's been our work? So our partners in this have been, uh, almost all of the farm worker partners have supported this legislation 
along the way, specifically the United Farm Workers Union, uh, PACUN, and our ally, Farm Worker Justice, but almost all of them are in support of this legislation. We promoted this specifically um, through um, legislative emails and things like that prior to, but in 2019, our board of directors met in Washington, D.C. to visit congressional leaders, and this was a piece of legislation that we included in our conversation um, when we went to visit the representatives. Um, we have resources that were developed to urge the passing of this legislation on a federal level, and we have been involved in helping to get people state by state to pass this legislation as well. Um, let me go back for just a second to say that one of the concerns about this legislation in the places where it has been enacted uh, over a period of time, most of the states have had a phase in program. Um, one of the struggles that we're seeing now are that in a lot of places, in order to avoid paying overtime for farm workers, um, growers and employers have opted to try to hire additional employees and keep all of them uh, to a maximum of 40 hours uh, a week so they don't have to pay overtime. So the impact of this on farm workers and in part what their intention has been is that farm workers themselves while they make more, uh, they they make the full amount for the forty hours. They don't get additional hours the way they did before. The intention, of course, was that beyond forty hours they would get time and a half. Um, but if they don't get any hours past forty, then to them they're not making as much money as they were making before. So this is one of the big challenges that um, farm worker partners and other people in the industry are trying to address in order to help farm workers, as you well know, who come to this country to earn as much as they can um, to take back to their home countries or to help them get from season to season when there isn't work. Another piece of legislation uh, has been pushed uh, heavily by the United Farm Workers Union, the Asuncion Valdivia Heat Illness and Fatality Prevention Act. Um, Asuncion Valdivia is the name of a farm worker who died from uh, heat stress complications. And so the bill was named after that farm worker. As climate change makes the temperatures hotter and hotter and hotter, there's more and more opportunity for farm workers to, um, to have heat stress and exposure and then for it to um, harm them or even kill them in some situations. Um, this particular bill, because uh, California as a state has enacted heat stress prevention standards, so um, priorities of which are hydration, uh, rest, and um, uh, shade for the work that they have. But there's no national heat stress standard. And in states like Florida or Texas, there, there are no provisions, even though presumably often those are equally as hot as California. Um, in recent years, the temperatures in Oregon and Washington state rose to a level that there were emergency um, requirements put into place. And so some of our farm worker partners in those states have worked to make those not just emergency protocols, but year round protections from farm workers whenever they might need that. Um, so this bill would direct. OSHA to put forward a standard, um, and because it would be a federal policy, policy OSHA would be required to do it and maintain it. Um, currently, there's been another effort to work with OSHA 
to create regulations, but those actually um, can be changed from uh, administration to administration. So having a piece of federal legislation that makes it law makes it much uh, more difficult for those regulations to change depending on the whims of whatever administration is, is in power. Our partners in this work, primary partners, are the Farm Worker Association of Florida and the United Farm Workers Union, along with Alianza Nacional de Campesinas. Although I will say that almost all farm worker partners, whether they can actively work on it or not, um, consider this a priority for legislation. Um, in January of 2022, after consulting with farm worker partners, the National Farm Worker Ministry submitted comments to OSHA about how they, uh, about the heat stress standards that they were putting forward. Um, and heat stress was one of the topics of um, harvest of justice in 2020. The other area that we have um, for years and years spent a long time working on is comprehensive immigration reform. Immigration policy affects farm workers and it affects their families. If we understand that over half of the current farm workforce are immigrants and the majority of those are undocumented, then immigration policy is vital. Um, for the health and protection of farm workers. Um, unfortunately, our current immigration policy or lack thereof leaves many farm workers vulnerable to abuse and a, a variety of um, struggles and ways that they can be exploited um, simply by the threat of deportation and being separated from their families. So for us, immigration reform must include pathways to citizenship for workers. So if we, if we go back, we'll uh, recognize that it's, it was 1986 that there was an immigration amnesty, amnesty program that was passed and 1.1 million Mexican farm workers gained legal status. Since then, there has... Um, been an effort to provide farm workers with a, a, a there there has been no effort to provide farm workers with a viable pathway to citizenship. Um, temporary <clears throat> guest worker visas, H two A program, have been provided through the Department of La Labor um, for seasonal work in the U S. But that program has a wide variety of challenges that make it really uh, untenable for employers. Um, as well as farm workers. So our partners and allies in this, um, all of our farm worker partners have worked on immigration issues in some form or fashion. All of them can address it. They don't all agree on the specific way to um, provide legislation that meets the needs that they have. There are different needs in different parts of the country. Um, in 2018, National Farm Worker Ministry joined the United Farm Worker Union, Farm Worker Justice, and a number of our farm worker partners to support what was called at that time the Agricultural Workers Program or Blue Card Bill. Um, and many agreed um, with it and lobbied for it during that period of time. In 2019, that legislation was replaced by the Farm Workforce Modernization Act, and this um, received much less broad support from all of our farm worker partners. Um, uh, it put forward parts of the blue card bill, and it garnered bipartisan support, even past the House of Representatives, but um, the, in the negotiations, the bill had changed quite a bit. It included E-Verify, and it included changes to the H-2A program, some of which were really troublesome for some of our farm worker partners, a number of which deal uh, a lot with H-2A workers in their own communities. 
So the National Farm Worker Ministry chose not to endorse the bill and also not to oppose it, um, but to push um, for reasonable a reasonable path to citizenship and a proper reform of the H-2A program. We have a statement on our website about that. Hi, everyone. I think it's my turn to pick it up. Um, you've heard a lot this evening about various pieces of legislation that may need your support. Um, as a reminder, uh, my name is Giovanna. I work for the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America out of our Washington, D.C. office, uh, where my day-to-day -day work involves mainly interacting with Congress and the executive branch on policies and programs that impact immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers. Uh, I'd like to share some ways that you can be an effective legislative advocate um, because there is a difference. <laughs> um, there are many different approaches and some are more successful than others. As you know, uh, public policy is influenced by everyday people like you rising up to make their voices heard. And in the legislative process, the key people you want to target are elected representatives, i.e. the members of Congress. This is both in the House and in the Senate. But I want to first address um, a uh, little bit of the elephant in the room. <laughs> uh, many people are understandably quite skeptical of how effective legislative advocacy is. You might want to think about your own feelings about Congress, not an individual member, but as an institution. Generally, most Americans are dissatisfied with the way their views are heard and acted on. For example, in a 2019 Pew Research survey, the majority of people said that they believed most elected officials were out of touch with people like them. So you might be asking yourself, do I feel like the issues I care about are heard and acted on? In a recent survey after the 2022 midterms, which saw Republicans regain control of the House of Representatives, only 30% of surveyed people said that they believed that the Biden administration or Republican leaders in Congress would be successful in passing their own policies. This shows that there is weak confidence in our institutions to operate effectively in a divided government. This is not helped by ongoing polarization and gridlock, which shrink the spaces for compromise even further. You might be asking, do I feel confident about the legislature to act on policies I care about? Yes, many people have an issue um, with Congress as an institution, and they believe that that issue comes down to how Congress receives input from the public about important policies impacting their lives. The U.S. isn't really an outlier in this respect. It's a global trend in um, distrust in democracy or um, lack of confidence in democratic norms. But the U.S. actually has some of the strongest democratic institutions and practices for people to share their concerns. It's a matter of people exercising um, those tools. In this grand marketplace of ideas, the loudest, most persistent voices gather the most support. I want to repeat that. <laughs> the most persistent voices gather the most support. Advocates are competing with other stakeholders and special interest groups for the time and attention of lawmakers. So with so many diverse viewpoints to sift through and members having limited time and resources, the quantity and quality of your outreach matters. Next slide. And I'll try to remember to slow down, apologies. <laughs> um, you need to first understand uh, who your member of Congress is. Um, the foundation of the re of representation in Congress is the geographic constituency, i.e. where you are based. Um, and you can do this very uh, simply by visiting house.gov or senate.gov and entering your zip code or navigating to your state to find who is your um, House of uh, Representative. Uh, who is your representative in the, in the House, and who uh, are your two senators. It's a, both of these websites are really good starting points to familiarize yourself with who your members of Congress are and what issues they prioritize, and even how to reach out to them. On, this, on these kinds of websites, you can find information such as um, the members, the, the congressional website. Each member of Congress has a professional congressional website where they manage um, service constituent services, requests for tours, et cetera. Uh, it's also where you can find information about how to contact their office, 
uh, and even submit forms, uh, like if you're requesting a meeting. Um, you can also visit congress.gov, it's a different website, to visit their record, um, what kind of bills they've introduced uh, and co-sponsored. Um, and you can also um, uh, search for their committee assignments. Um, it's important to know their committee assignments because this signals what issues they have jurisdiction over in Congress and what they may have uh, an ability to influence even more strongly. Out of, uh, on all of the issues you've heard about tonight, it's important to know what your member supports and doesn't support so you can tailor your message appropriately. And it's okay to engage members who don't share your views. Respectfully sharing your viewpoints is how you can do your part to educate your members on these issues. Next page. Members of Congress do in fact care about what you think. Research from the Congressional Management Foundation indicates that staff in congressional offices overwhelmingly believe that responding to constituent communications is a high priority for them. As this graph shows, 89% of House congressional offices make it a priority to hear from constituents. 95% of Senate congressional offices make it a priority to hear from their constituents. It's a little bit of a difference there. Not only do offices prioritize responding communication to communication from their constituents, i.e. you, they also believe it makes a difference in how they ultimately vote. Branford Fitch, the president and CEO of the Congressional Management Foundation, says that constituents are the most important factor, especially when it comes to undecided lawmakers. Here are some surprising results from a survey that the Congressional Management Foundation conducted of a staff of staffers between 2004 and 2017 proving that in fact communication from constituents are felt to make a difference by staff who receive them but it's different for each form of communication in-person meetings are the most successful i.e staffers said that 94 percent of the time they felt that this had some or a lot of influence on an, undec on an undecided lawmaker. Compare this to form email messages. Those are a, an example of a form email message would be something like an action alert. Just 56% of uh, congressional staff felt that this had some or a lot of influence on a lawmaker. Phone calls are also less uh, influential compared to in-person meetings. And uh, significantly, but not too much, uh, much less uh, influential than individualized letters and email messages. Not included on this chart is social media. Nowadays, virtually all members of Congress and congressional committees have adopted social media. This includes the use of Facebook, Twitter, and other platforms. Two decades ago, this was not the case. Because individuals decide who, which members to follow, we tend to create our own echo chambers. So you have to be mindful that um, sometimes members of Congress may not be hearing from you and you may not be aware of what your member of Congress is doing if you don't follow each other. This is one of the downsides of social media. It creates a bit of an echo chamber around uh, each other, uh, ourselves and the issues that we care about. Another downside to social media is that it tends to flatten very complex issues by reducing them into shorter, kind of pithier language that is usually delivered in a very quick manner. This can erase the complexities and nuance of some of these issues. On the plus side, social on the plus side of social media is that um, offices can gather almost real-time data on how constituents and, and users of social media feel about an issue. So more social media savvy offices are beginning to follow and try to understand these trends in order to receive input about policy issues. What I want to underline uh, from this graph and the discussion about social media 
is really that the more personalized your interactions, the more influential they are. Next slide. By now, um, you should know how to search your members of Congress. Next, I'll provide some guidance on the two most effective tactics, that is meetings and personalized letters. I'll also end on a note about social media. Ultimately, what you wanna be able to do is to connect an issue to you and or your group's opinion so that a if a lawmaker is undecisive or undecided, they can discern their support based on a wide swath of support and input, not just one side. As I mentioned, um, lawmakers don't have a lot of time to sift through these issues. So the more they hear about something, the more likely it will um, come to their uh, top of their mind when they're deciding whether to vote or not to vote on something. Um, in terms of virtual and in-person meetings, um, I want to say there isn't really uh, a difference nowadays. Um, the pandemic has really opened up many opportunities to do virtual meetings. Instead of feeling like you have to come to Washington, D.C. or go to a district office to meet with um, either a member of Congress or one of their staff. In general, though, um, members of Congress will be too busy to take a meeting request. So you might end up meeting with a staff person instead. And it's just as important to establish a relationship with that uh, staff person and that office. The first part uh, is reaching out. As I mentioned, congressional websites have, most congressional websites have a meeting request form, or you can call the office to request a meeting. It's really important to be clear um, what format you're requesting the meeting. If you're calling a district office and you want to meet in district, if you want to meet in Washington, DC, or if you're requesting a meeting virtually. Normally, an intern or legislative correspondent is the person who picks up the phone or responds to your email. Um, and if you don't know who to meet with, you can ask them to connect you with the appropriate staff person who deals with that issue. Usually, this is uh, known as somebody, the, the person who is known to do this is the legislative assistant on that matter. Um, in the email that you send out, you want to list the top issues you'd like to discuss. And I also really want to emphasize that you include your zip code um, because some offices will not pay attention to letters or requests for meetings that do not include zip codes. Of course, they want to prioritize hearing mainly from their constituents. And also include a number of the constituents of, in your group who plan to attend. Now, a little note about the people who attend your meeting. Make sure you have a wide representation. Maybe it's uh, somebody representing the business community, a faith leader, um, maybe somebody with lived experience. It's important to really center the voices of those with lived experience in some of these topics. Uh, so I think you should really consider um, reaching out to maybe it's a farm worker or reaching out to somebody who has um, directly been impacted by the policy you'll be discussing. All right, my third tip is that if you are still lost, you can reach out to an organization who has a legislative affairs office. And many of denominations and NFWM uh, are capable of helping you set up a meeting if you don't know where to get started. All right, the preparation is the most intensive part. Um, this is where all of the work really goes in. Um, you need to know, first of all, what your member is supporting. You need to do all kinds of background research. Um, understand where your, your member of Congress is coming from so that you can tailor your message to them. Um, you want to get to know the people that are gonna be attending your meeting and who is going to be um, uh, represented on the call. Um, and part of the prep work is assigning roles. I won't go through too much of this because I think I'm running out of time. Um, and some of these resources will be provided. But one uh, easy way to remember who needs uh, the different roles in the meeting uh, is to think of somebody who would be the introducer, uh, the person who would be a storyteller or storytellers, the person who is actually making the ask. For example, um, representative so-and-so, uh, thank you for your time. 
We would really value your input on this and we would really like your support on this legislation. Is that something that you think you can do today? Every meeting has to come with an ask and it's really important that you don't forget to make that, that ask. Um, a fourth role might be a questioner, somebody who is able to ask um, questions of the staff that you're meeting with and is ready to keep the conversation uh, going so that the staff is not talking the whole time, but it's really a dialogue. And then uh, finally, um, you, you would want to have a closer, somebody th uh, who can thank the, the staffer or the member for their time um, and, if appropriate, um, uh, you know, usually do the follow-up as well. Um, the follow-up is uh, really important. It's the way to for offices to remember who they just met with. Um, it's a thank you, it's a simple thank you email, and you can assign any one of the participants to do that. Sometimes your meetings will be thirty minutes. That's usually the industry standard, I guess. Um, it might just be three minutes. So if you only have three minutes with somebody to discuss your issue, be prepared to do an elevator pitch. Um, a quick uh, tip I learned about this recently, a mnemonic device is thinking of it as you, me, us. You, you me, I, you, you introduce yourself, you talk about them, and you talk about what you can do together. All right, um, next slide. Continuing on ways that you can build relationships with offices, as I mentioned, individualized letters slash email messages are pretty impactful, um, but you have to remember to personalize them. So if you're using an action alert, even if it, you make it one sentence different, that's enough. Um, a lot of these e uh, form emails, these action alerts get batched together. And so you need a thousand uh, you know, action alerts to come in to make a difference. Whereas if you personalize your message, um, it's the person who is receiving it can file it away as something else, right? Um, other kinds of individualized letters that you can send in are things like postcard campaigns. Um, you can work with your community to do a letter writing campaign where you physically, you know, then mail that letter. Um, and you can do different kind of delivery strategies like going to Washington, D.C. or dropping it off in a district office. Finally, um, you can um, publish letters to the editor or op-eds, and it's a lot simpler than people realize. It's, it's not that hard. You just have to be uh, skilled at writing succinctly, and you have to do follow-up with the newspaper to make sure that your article, um, that your, your opinion is actually shared on that newspaper. Um, we'll follow up with resources on that later. All right. Um, just a final closing thought on social media. If you don't have the bandwidth or time to join meetings, that's okay. You can engage with your members of Congress on Twitter, on Facebook. You can use, you can share social media graphics. Uh, you can encourage other people to um, share your social media graphics and do hashtags and things like that. Um, and the most effective way to use social media is by coordinating with others around a social media campaign. So. Um, the more you coordinate, the more effective social media it can be. All right, um, I'll turn it back to uh, the hosts. Sorry for taking a little longer. Well, I didn't see any questions within the chat, but I think we have time for, for one or maybe two if they're quick questions. Or if you have a legislative strategy that's worked well for you, feel free to, to drop that in the chat as well. Uh, Sophia, looks like you have a question. Yeah, just really quick, um, because I love this kind of stuff. Um, will uh, we get a copy of this presentation um, that we can also share with um, churches to uh, encourage their members to, to do this kind of legislative work as well? Great question. So next week we will send out um, all the resources that we have. Um, Gio mentioned how individualized letters can be really effective. 
We have some letters uh, already established for some of the legislation we talked about earlier. So you could copy and paste that, but then you can personalize it uh, as well. So it gives you something to, to work off of. So yes, we will be sending out all of the resources and strongly encourage all of you to share those resources with your communities, anyone who you know is interested in. Uh, Jim? <clears throat> yeah, so I'm part of a small grassroots group in Michigan. And we figured out how to get internet access into some of the migrant worker farms. It's one of the so so we participated in the Department of Labor listening tour. We just kind of stumbled upon it and in time to participate. And the thing that struck me is it's of course on no one else's legislative agenda, but it's one of those things we the, our goal was to get it into the H two A. Uh, standards for worker housing standards. Does that make sense? So here's one of those things where you have the the issues relating to to let you know uh, trying to interact with Congress, and then you have the legislative groups, right? The 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 folks who are doing that. And here we found this small thing that we would like to try to get in. We can't figure out how to interact with any of those groups. Maybe I'm doing that right now, right? Like participating in a Friday webinar, right? But, uh, right, but that, and also that we have, we, we have one networks and we also have, like I used to do regulatory impact analysis for OSHA. So, right, those kind of things where we kind of make pattern about what resources people have. So I'm just trying to figure out how to not just have the meetings with uh, Congress, but also some of the other legislative groups um, outside of the usual uh, systems. So, Julie, you're you're shaking your head, but I think your uh, meaning encouragement of go ahead and, and email us, uh, Jim at nfwm at nfwm.com uh, with questions or more information. Because yes, we'd love to connect with you. Dot org. So, yep. If you want to go to the next slide or final slide. We thank you so much for joining us and we strongly encourage you to connect with us as you've probably figured out and this legislation is going to have a lot of updates. We mentioned that all of them need to be reintroduced, that they could be changed or altered from previous versions. So if you want to stay up to date on, on what's happening with the legislation. And then just overall what's happening within the farm worker movement, we encourage you to follow us on social media. You can see that we have a variety of channels there. So pick your favorites. And then subscribe to our newsletter if you aren't already a, a subscriber. And if you know of somebody who is interested, please share this message. That's the one of the biggest ways that will make impact too. I think Gio mentioned about how the loudest and the persistent, most persistent voice is what gets heard. So together, let's be really loud. <laughs>